All righty. It is seven o'clock and I do want to get started on time because uh, we are do have a, a little less time here at the library. But first of all, good evening. Welcome to the Fairview Park Public Library and our Western Cuyahoga Audubon meeting. Hello, Zoomers. Glad to have you join us as well. And, uh, you know, if you have questions, um, put them in the chat, uh, folks. And we are going to have a great evening tonight. I've got uh, several announcements. And I also want to announce when these lights go off, they go off. And when we turn them back on, it's, it's really, really bright. So <laughs> we'll uh, just another warning. All righty. So uh, it is Tuesday, February 6th. And it is, um, I guess, a, a lovely winter. I don't know. What, what do you think about winter so far? Yeah, I'd rather have snow. If it's going to be cold, let's have some snow, right? Okay, so next slide, please. Oh, that's me. I'm Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And I'll be well, first welcoming you. Did I do that already? And then um, I have lots and lots of volunteer opportunities at the back table. And I hope that you will consider signing up for at least one of them. Same thing with Zoomers, too. We have them uh, listed on our website. So we hope that folks will sign up for some of these events. Uh, the newsletter and uh, also becoming a member. So next slide, please. All right. So a couple of things we've been in invited to are uh, some Earth Day events. Uh, one of them is Saturday, April 20th. Uh, from 10 to 3 at Co Lake Park. This is a sustainable Berea Earth Day. And there will be two um, volunteer sessions, 10 or about 9.30 to 12.30. There's some setup and getting things ready. And then there's an afternoon session. At the back table, there is a sign-up sheet for that Earth Day event. Uh, we will need a bird walk leader for that uh, day as well. What time the bird walk is, I don't know right off the top of my head. We've in, been invited to the Parma Heights Earth Day event, uh, and that is Saturday, April 27th. So one Saturday, one right after the other. Uh, it is at Greenbrier Commons, uh, which is by the Parma Heights Library. And uh, this one's only in the afternoon from one to four. And it's, it's a very, very nice event. I was able to uh, take part in that last year. Uh, so again, set up, set up the display, um, ch chat with the public. Uh, there'll be some activities that we're going to be uh, working with because they have a theme on pollinators. So I think we'll be doing some perhaps planting of seeds that the families can take home and, and uh, have the kids plant in there or folks plant in their yards. And then in May, uh, the West Shore Unitarian Universalist Church is having an Earth Day event. Uh, I'm hoping this is correct, from 10 to 3. It is indoors, and that is on Saturday, May 11th. And again, I have a sign-up sheet at the back table. We will have two shifts for that one as well. So we hope that uh, folks can, can join in with that. Uh, if you need more information, you can either reach me here tonight or uh, real easy, Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. Next, please. Aha, more volunteer opportunities. For the past many years, uh, with the help of uh, Penny O'Connor, who has now passed, uh, we've been uh, judging parts of the Northeastern Ohio Science and Engineering Fair. That, uh, that uh, judging is taking place on Tuesday, March 12th, uh, runs from about noon, where you can preview the, the um, uh, projects that the students are doing, judge the projects, talk with the students, and that runs till about 4.30. There is a dinner afterward, too, for judges, so uh, consider that. Is it, it is at Cleveland State University. I do have one judge already, possibly two but there is a sign-up sheet at the back if you are interested in judging. It's really, really a lot of fun uh, chatting with the kids on their projects. 
Um, and then one more thing we've been asked to find volunteers for is the Sand Hill Crane Survey. Uh, it is only on one day, uh, and we're not running this. This is uh, Saturday, April 13th from 6.30 in the morning. Please note, not 6.30 in the evening, 6.30 in the morning to 8.30. Um, these surveys are done through the Division of Wildlife, the International Crane Foundation, and the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. Um, we're not looking for folks for Cuyahoga County. There are no crane sightings that, I mean, they fly over, they may land, but they are, are not here uh, potentially nesting. So uh, they these uh, surveys take place in either Wayne County, Medina County, Lorraine County, Lake County, a bunch of counties. So again, if you're interested in participating, that one day, again, only a couple of hours in the morning, we can link you up with the people who are running the show and uh, which county or counties may need some help. There's a sign-up sheet at the back table. I want to see those sign-up sheets all filled in tonight. Next, please. Of course, keep informed with our newsletter. You can either receive our e-newsletter, which is uh, once a week, comes in through MailChimp, uh, you can sign up, uh, but then, you know, if you're like, oh man, I'm getting too much of this. You can um, unsubscribe at any time. And of course, we always like people to become a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Uh, you can do that this evening. You can go on the website, um, PayPal, check, cash, whatever, All right? So yeah, we'd uh, this is how we, we keep things running. All right, next, Michelle Brocious, one of our board members. All right, thank you very much. Um, I would just like to say that we have 20 people on Zoom this evening, so thank you so much for um, tuning in. And I am Michelle Brocious. I am running the Zoom and the audiovisual equipment this evening. Oh, and one more note. Um, the folks on Zoom cannot hear us unless we use the microphone. So if you have any questions, raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you so that they can hear your question. And those of you on Zoom, I'm trying my best to keep you all on mute, but we can totally hear you in the room if you're talking in the background. So just keep that in mind. All right, I'm going to be discussing bird walks and how you could connect with us on social media. All right, so we have our second Saturday bird walk coming up this Saturday. Um, that is at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Um, Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand, thank you very much, Al, um, are our leaders for that walk. Uh, we meet at 9 a.m., um, so hope to see you there. Uh, and I just want to get this out right now. We have had this walk for... 30 years, the second Saturday bird walk, the Cleveland Metro Parks has their annual plant sale during our um, walk in May. So they have asked us to park somewhere else. So we will be meeting instead of at the Nature Center at Frostville Museum. So plenty of time before May, get the word out. We have this information on our website and our calendar. If you wake up on a Saturday, want to join us and you, you're not sure where it is, just pull it up and check and we'll be sending out emails and reminders until May. Uh, all right, I'm really excited about this. Um, my friend, uh, Lynn Shaco, who I've been trying to get to lead bird walks for about a year now um, for us has decided to um, lend her skills and take us out on bird walks. So she will be starting afternoon bird walks this month. Um, her first one with us is February 17th at 3 p.m. at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. So she is excellent. I met her a couple years ago when she was doing bird walks for, uh, it was a Facebook group, a hiking women's group, um, not necessarily for birds, but that piqued my interest. So I, I went and met her there and i um, so glad that she can join us and, and volunteer for WCAS. I went back, I'm sorry. I shouldn't talk with my hands so much. All right, Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk, um, always the fourth Saturday of each month, not necessarily the last Saturday. Um, sometimes we have five Saturdays. So our next one is February 24th at 9 a.m. 
Um, we meet at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue. And Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. And finally, um, you can connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, um, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, so please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All of our recorded presentations are um, put on that YouTube channel. And I share a bunch of interesting things on the other um, social media as well. So please, if you're on any of these, follow us, subscribe. Thank you very much. Thanks so That's much, it. Michelle. Thank you. And and are, there was some gorgeous photos there, I hope you noticed. The, the, the birds... Michelle is a, a fabulous photographer. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Drina Nemes, our uh, book discussion coordinator. Drina. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. And I would just like to say, too, uh, Michelle's photographs are so beautiful. And, and the latest issue of Birdwatcher's Digest features uh, an article by Michelle with gorgeous pictures. So thank you, Drina. Next slide, please. Well, we're coming up to our third book discussion for this season, and uh, it is a marvelous book, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, and it's by Susan Samard, who grew up in, sure, who grew up in uh, British Columbia, uh, uh, in a, a history of her whole family as loggers, so she know, knew the forest inside and out. Next slide, please. April 23rd. Seven o'clock on Zoom. Um, if you're interested, you can find many YouTube videos to get an introduction to Susan Samard. And uh, there are so many. I put one up here, but there are many. Then also there's a wonderful interview with uh, Terry Gross on from Fresh Air. Uh, the book is available at Cuyahoga County Public Library and the Cleveland Public Library. Um, they do have, they say they have audio books and um, e-books, but they're all taken. <laughs> so, um, but plenty of other regular hard copy books. And uh, a summary of her book is a personal and scientific work on trees, forests, and the author's profound discoveries of tree communication. Next slide, please. We just finished our, our last discussion, Vesper Flights, and you can find it on YouTube. And next slide, please. And also our previous uh, book discussions from our previous years, we're in our fourth season, are also available. I keep on looking for the Feather Thief when it's gonna come out as a uh, TV series and it's still in limbo. So next slide, please. Our good friend, David Lindo. Uh, he has a series in conservation with, and um, he has two scheduled uh, for the winter, February 8th and March 12th, and you can find them on his website. And then just, I think it was uh, just in late January, he uh, interviewed Ken Kaufman um, on renaming North American birds, and many of us know Ken Kaufman or heard of him. And I think that's it. I think there are no more slides. Thank you very, very much, Drina. Uh, and now, Marianne Romito, who is our Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Hi there, everybody. Th everybody. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who has been participating in the Climate Watch. Climate Watch, the winter session, has been from January 15th through February 15th. So there's still a few days left for those of you who have volunteered and haven't gotten out yet. Or if you still want to volunteer, I can give you a square and send you out. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, first of all, Time Magazine made it, did an article this, this week, I think it was, um, about the, the COP28, the, the, what's it called? The conference of the parties which is a committee that was formed after the the uh, climate watch initiative that they had a few years ago many years ago um so the 
I would just want to read you this one little paragraph. It says, uh, while COP28 last year provided glimmers of hope that countries can meaningfully, meaningfully, meaningfully respond, it is increasingly clear that the rise of global temperature will exceed 1.5 centigrade threshold defined in the 2015 Paris Agreements. Already, we are at 1.15 centigrade. So we're at 1.15 centigrades of the heating above the 19th century baseline and will likely pass the 1.5 in the mid 2030s. So the, um, but the thing, the good news at, and then in this article, I, I, I was the first, first, first page and then the last page or the last par paragraph because already the world is full of small climate action success stories. We need better monitoring and, eva and, and to evaluate them, bring people in and institutions from all levels of government and institutions. And that's why we're doing the Climate Watch. We're helping Audubon with by providing them with data. And we're doing that through Audubon's Survival by Degrees program. And inside this little flyer that I have, which if you go on their website for, for Survival by Degrees, you can see little maps that are interactive that will show you as the temperature rises, where the where the temperature where the territories are going to be for your all the birds that we have in the United, in the in our part of the world, I think I don't know if they cover them worldwide or not, but I know if they cover for sure in, in North America. So if you're interested in in joining me, um, go on to the next one. Um, we can go past that one too. The, the 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 we still have until February fifteenth to to finish the 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 count, and next one. And here's if you want to take a picture of this this slide because that video up there explains how you do a, the climate watch. And then there's my contact information if you want to get hold of me. So or you can hit me up after the the program. Questions? All right. Yeah, I know that last paragraph said January 20th, boom, one, and we're done. That was when we had a snowstorm and a lot of people didn't get out. We were going to try to get everybody, as most people out on one day. But as Marianne was saying, that Climate Watch could be done anywhere between, again, January 15th and February 15th. So um, it's a lot of fun. 12 points, five minutes per point. Keep re record your birds and turn them in. Easy. Um, bird friendly coffee. Amanda uh, couldn't be here this evening, but let's go to the next slide. Um, we uh, do sell birds. Oh, good. I'm glad you like this photo because Amanda was uh, wishy washy. I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, but it's the only, it is Smithsonian certified fair trade organic. Uh, the forests are not clear cut because the coffee beans are raised as they should be in the shade of the uh, of the forest. And uh, so if farmers make a living wage. And so it's it's all good. And it's good coffee too. And we have a variety of, of beans, grinds, and flavors. I mean, not flavors, but roasts. How about that? So our coffee club, uh, of course, is on the website. And the next order is going in in, in April. We, we order quarterly because that's when we can get enough uh, ounces to get free shipping. We do not want to put shipping onto our or add shipping onto any of your orders. So um, April 10th is the next one, but you can order any time. We just keep a list and add it up as April comes along. Next, please. All right. Uh, before we get into this evening's talk, I just wanted to mention for next month, uh, more birds, please. Uh, the focus to condition assessment, birds of the of conservation concern in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Again, we're going to get two people tonight uh, that evening, uh, Doug Markham and Ryan Trimbath. They're both biologists for the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And they are going to be talking about some of the birds that are being found in the Cuyahoga Valley, might be coming into the Cuyahoga Valley, or maybe their numbers are decreasing. So uh, we hope that you can make that Tuesday, March 5th, uh, to hear about the, the research going on in the Cuyahoga Valley. And you may be part of that research if you turn in data uh, on eBird or uh, Get in touch with the Cuyahoga Valley folks. 
Next. Now, before I get into our discussion tonight or our speaker tonight, I did want to mention that tonight, of course, we'll be hearing about insects, but the um, my World Migratory Bird Day, which occurs on the uh, May 11th and October 12th, that's my peak migration time for our, our neotropical migrants, their theme this year is protect insects, protect birds. So this is how important the Environment for the Americas has selected this theme, insects. Next, please. So of course, our February speaker, Dr. Andrew Merwin from uh, Assistant Bio Biology Professor at Baldwin Wallace College or University, insects, the good, the bad, and the declining. Let's welcome Dr. Merwin. Next, please. Next slide. Ah. There you are, there he is, yeah. And uh, um, he is an assistant professor of biology at, at Baldwin Wallace. He says he, he studies insects, uh, insect ecology, and is never bored by the natural world, world. He comes to Ohio from Florida State University. I think that was right, okay. And I, what's really nice is he's had some of his students looking at data from uh, of eBird data from the spring uh, bird walk series at, that are held at Lake Isaac. There's over 40 years worth of data, not all not all because of my, my leading there, there were other leaders too, um, but looking at bird populations, species changes, and how these are affected by the way the Metro Parks has managed that land. Uh, Dr. Merwin lives in Shaker Heights with, with his wife, Meredith Steck, and Meredith uh, is an assistant director in the Writing Center's English department, and Meredith is here this evening. Moral support, yay! All righty. Thank you, and we'll get his uh, program up shortly. Yes, uh, just give me a moment Stand to right. shut that down. Stand right about here. Yep. yep. So, yep. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Zoomers. While I'm making the transition here, Paula on Zoom did ask, and I, uh, when will the bridge be open? I think she's talking about the bridge on Cedar Point Road near Frostfield. Has anyone heard when that bridge is going to be open? Okay. Thank you. Um, someone said no sooner than October. Um, so, yeah, as, as you're making your way to the Frostville Museum for our second Saturday Bird Walk, make sure you um, take the detour. All right. So let me pull up Dr. Merwin's program here. And, okay, this is always difficult. It is right. Is this it right there? Yeah. All right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, let me see if my, my oh, there we go. All right. Thank you guys so much for hosting me. I'm really excited to be here. I am a dues paying member of the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. <laughs> but I, this is my first meeting, although I've been on numerous uh, bird walks uh, with Nancy. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm out. Of, I need like a like a perimeter here. So I can. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Beyond the table. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, entertaining a talk on insects tonight. As Nancy said, insects are, of course, very important um, to your your feathered friends. Um, unfortunately, I don't study their interactions with birds at all. I've tried to like sneak in a bunch of slides of birds to like help keep you guys entertained. Uh, but insects are cool too. I'm sure many of you are, are fans already, but I'll hopefully convince you um, to like them even more by the end of the night. Um, and so Nancy was very generous. She let me talk um, about anything I wanted to regarding insects. And it was really hard for me to make up my mind. So I've kind of put together a bit of a hodgepodge of um, uh, mostly <laughs> mostly catering to research that I've done, because that's what I, I know most about. So I'm just going to lead you through some things that I think are kind of interesting. And um, hopefully uh, you'll think they're interesting too. So I've called my talk, Insects, the Good, the Bad, and the Declining. And I'm literally just going to break it up into three parts about good insects, things that we consider bad insects, but are perhaps interesting anyway. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about declining insects um, and, and just like one slide of things that we can do to, to help them out. Um, but the good. Um, this is one of my favorite slides uh, that I like to share with students. It's from an old textbook, but the size of each one of these organisms um, illustrates uh, the species diversity um, that each of that 
that, that particular taxon or that particular group of organisms represents. Um, and I just love this figure here where it shows that obviously a gigantic fly and maybe not everybody would think that's good. I think it's incredible, <laughs> but um, there are of course uh, like 5.5 a million species estimated of insects. So they're very hyper diverse. Um, so compare that to about the 10,000 described species of birds gives you an idea of just how incredibly uh, diverse insects are. Uh, which always gives me a great excuse for not knowing what species somebody has. Like, what bug is this? Like, I don't know. There's like 10 million of them. But uh, but anyway, so they're really diverse. So it's not surprising that they are integral to our terrestrial and aquatic food webs, freshwater food webs. Um, of course, they provide, um, you know, high nitrogen uh, and fat snacks um, for, for breeding birds. And uh, many migratory birds, of course, time their migration um, to hit the insects just right and eat them. Um, this is uh, true too in uh, aquatic uh, or freshwater ecosystems where insects make up a, an important component of the, the protein diet of uh, fish. Insects are also, of course, important decomposers. Um, dung beetles uh, play an important role uh, getting rid of uh, the waste products of mammals. Um, they're so important, in fact, that in Australia, uh, when they introduced cattle, they had to also introduce dung beetles. Otherwise, the dung just like piled up and the cattle wouldn't feed around that dung. So uh, really important critters for ecosystems. They provide us with, um, of course, many products that we enjoy, including shellac and, um, and honey. Um, and they're important uh, pollinators, both in wild ecosystems and um, in our agricultural settings. So here's a fun uh, figure that was um, taken by employees at a Whole Foods in University Heights, but not the University Heights here. Sorry, I just found this out. It was the University Heights in um, Massachusetts. Uh, but anyway, you can see on the left here is just, like all the regular produce you would see walking into a, a Whole Foods. And on the right, um, the produce uh, has been removed that required pollinators. And so you just see like, uh, a really clear visual demonstration of how much we rely on pollinators to get our food. Insects are also good um, because they eat other insects. <laughs> so a lot of um, uh, a lot of pest control um, actually uh, is performed by uh, predaceous insects that eat uh, herbivorous insects. Of course, we all love uh, ladybird beetles um, that consume our aphids. And there are other predaceous insects that are agriculturally important as well. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys about some of these. These are ground beetles, um, both uh, from the same family, Carabidae. Um, this is a beautiful uh, tiger beetle over here, the Carolina uh, metallic tiger beetle. And this is um, what we call a black caterpillar hunter, Calisoma sei. Um, both of these species are found in uh, Southeast United States, where I did my PhD research. So um, they are uh, very common um, uh, biological control agents that are naturally occur in agricultural fields. And in those fields, um, they will encounter kind of uh, different hodgepodge of plants. So this is just a community garden. Um, which is full of different uh, plant patches of different shapes and sizes. And I've been really interested in how um, insects interact with their landscapes and how things like um, the patches of plants um, uh, help uh, kind of shuttle insects into different like concentrations, whether like if it's a big patch, whether um, there'll be more like a higher density of insects in there or a lower density of insects in there. And uh, so one of the questions that I've worked on is how do habitat patch size and shape influence the movements and densities of some of these beetles that are important um, potentially in agriculture and, and controlling pests. Uh, so I performed a really large experiment uh, to address this question. And I did this in a soybean field uh, and I made patches of soybeans of different shapes and sizes. Um, two characteristics of patches that the literature suggests could be important are just like area, like just general size. So I did patches of, you know, four a meter squared, six meters squared, and 12 meters squared. And perimeter to area ratio has also been considered um, to be important in the literature in terms of how likely an insect is to find a patch and then lose a patch. Um, so I did two different um, perimeter to area ratios here. Um, so I've got thick patches and thin patches of different sizes. And this is how they looked. Uh, this is kind of like a schematic of how they looked. Um, it was hard to manipulate a patch size and perimeter to area ratio um, because the the rows of soybeans are, are standard like 10 centimeters apart or so. I can't remember exactly. Maybe it was 10 inches apart. Um, but anyway, so they, they kind of have these weird shapes, but um, you can rest assured that they are the same uh, perimeter to area ratio down the columns and the same area down the sides. Um, and so here's here's kind of what my field looked like. I really wish I had gotten a drone picture of it. Um, but again, here are those um, patches 
of different shapes and sizes arranged um, in different uh, in different orientations in this um, this big field. And here you can kind of see the patches of soybeans. Uh, they're a little bit low there. Um, and this was performed in Tallahassee, Florida, where it's just super hot in the summer. And it's just, man, I would just go out there and uh, look at my my pitfall traps uh, and my clothes would just be like saturated in sweat by the end of that hour. Um, but I, I check these pitfall traps every day. These pitfall traps are very sophisticated scientific equipment. Um, they consist of two solo cups and then just a styrofoam plate covering it, keeping the rain out. Um, don't uh, try to purchase uh, pitfall traps um, on a game day in Tallahassee when the Seminoles are playing because it's really, really hard to find uh, pitfall traps those days. Uh, but the day after the game, you find them for free everywhere. So um, you just got to... It's hit or miss. It's hit or miss at the pitfall traps there. Um, but I had two pitfall traps in each one of these patches. And uh, and then I, I, I collected the beetles that, that came in there. So both the, um, the uh, tiger beetles as well as the caterpillar hunters. And so tiger beetles, I'll just give you a little background. They, um, they, they tend to like um, kind of open area. It's like a dry soil, um, uh, not necessarily dry, but, but, you know, uh, uninterrupted by vegetation. And so my, my thought was that maybe they'd be more frequent in the thinner patches than the thicker patches. Um, just, they just happen to end up in the patches kind of in their, their meanderings. Um, and if they were thinner, they're more likely to get into the trap. Uh, so this is my prediction. And I, yeah, for various reasons, I didn't really think that area would matter, although the literature considers it to be important. Um, and uh, when I collected my beetles, uh, this is the trend that I found. They seem to not be affected by patch area whatsoever. So it's kind of a, a boring, uh, maybe it's not boring, but you know, an interesting uh, non-significant result. Um, but when you take into account plant height, it did seem that they preferred um, uh, thinner patches or ended up in thinner patches more frequently uh, than in thicker patches. So um, suggesting that, yeah, maybe if you want to get um, tiger beetles in your patches to control your insect pests, maybe you want those patches to be to be long and skinny with a high perimeter to area ratio. I also looked at the second large uh, carabid that, that happened to be in my plots, the caterpillar hunter. And as its name suggests, it actually like climbs up on plants and will like pull down uh, caterpillars and, and eat them quite uh, voraciously. And this, because this one actually climbs up on plants, um, I, I, I predicted that it would actually um, concentrate in thicker patches of plants. Um, that was my prediction based on um, some actual, some theory in the literature as well. Um, but we saw this really weird pattern <laughs> where actually um, they seem to really uh, concentrate into like thin patches. The blue line here is thin patches. I'm sorry, and I don't think I inter introduced the axes. Um, but we just have patch area on the horizontal axis here and and just number of individuals collected on the vertical axis. And um, yeah, in those thin patches, um, we have this weird interaction where they don't like the small thin patches, but they really like the long, long thin patches. Um, and uh, I don't know, they like the thick patches intermediately, but it doesn't really depend on the size. Oh, my, my oh no, my, uh, my emoji got cropped out in a weird way. Uh, anyway, uh, so... Uh, I, I wanted to double check that this is a consequence of their movement. So I marked a lot of beetles, put some um, some makeup on them and 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 watch them move from patches to patches. And sure enough, um, their movements, if I of the number of uh, marked beetles that I recollected, uh, it mirrored uh, pretty closely the 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 pattern that I had seen. Whoops, I guess I didn't put this up. It mirrored pretty closely the pattern I'd seen. Um, previously in just the total numbers. So it seems to be a consequence of, of their movement. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of a, uh, not, not the results I was expecting, but um, the, the tiger beetles prefer um, thin patches with shorter plants. Um, and then the, the larger beetles, um, the, the, the caterpillar hunters, they prefer uh, large thin patches. And so when you're thinking about how you want to design um, your community garden plots or the plots of your garden, your backyard, perhaps, um, it might be useful uh, to consider the shape and size of those patches. So um, to get the most bang for your buck, I guess, long skinny patches um, could be a good option if you're, you're really concerned about tiger beetles and getting those in there. Um, okay, so I kind of flew through that. I'll, I'll try to slow down a bit, but um, I'm just going to pivot um, to insects that maybe we are less fond of. Um, of course, mosquitoes are, are uh, a species or, or a family of insects that um, a lot of people aren't uh, really too keen on. They, they vector a lot of diseases. 
lot of other insects that I've already mentioned, um, maybe pests and um, can uh, be economically costly because they're competing with us for our own food. Um, and then we have invasive species that can really devastate ecosystems. So one of those species is the emerald ash borer, um, which uh, was introduced, you know, um, in, near the, the Michigan uh, Ontario border um, in 2002, and has since spread uh, across the central North uh, United States. Um, and this has had some interesting consequences. So uh, I, this is these are data from the Christmas bird count. And um, on the vertical axis here, we have uh, the relative abundance of woodpeckers and nuthatches, just, just lumps together. Mm -hmm. And on the horizontal axis here, we have years since the um, emerald ash borer has been introduced. And you'll see that um, the number of woodpeckers and nuthatches has, has gone up um, after the introduction of the emerald ash borer, uh, you know, primar primarily because they're consuming <laughs> those emerald ash borers. So, um, yeah, so... There are interesting consequences sometimes of invasive populations. I'm not trying to suggest that it's been a good thing that the emerald ash borer has been introduced since they are obviously um, decimating our ash trees. Um, but uh, this just to point out that sometimes um, invasive species can uh, it lead to interesting consequences that we didn't necessarily anticipate in, in the beginning. Um, and so I wanted to the segue into some research I'm more familiar with, my own research, um, also in the southeast of the United States. Um, I did some work on this square little individual here. That is not a life-size image. Um, they're about the size of maybe smaller than a dime, I guess. Um, these guys are really cute. They're kind of like almost as, as wide as they are long. They're called kudzu bugs, and they were introduced to North America uh, from Japan, um, in about 2008 in like the Atlanta area. And they've spread across uh, the Southeast. And uh, I guess before I get into the research that I've done on them, I've wanted to first um, pivot to cane toads. <laughs> so, and I'll tell you how it relates in a second. Um, so cane toads were introduced um, to North, uh, what, uh, East rather, <laughs> Northeast Australia uh, in the 1940s to control um, uh, cane grubs, um, which it turns out they don't even they don't even eat, um, but they've spread really quickly um, across uh, the north of Australia. And as they've done so, it turns out that um, the the rates of spread. So this is on the vertical axis here. We have kind of like the the there's their spread rate in kilometers, um, and on the horizontal axis we've got years. And the rate of spread has kind of increased um, exponentially, at least up until uh, 2010 or so. Um, and so it hasn't been just like this linear increase in range. Instead, it's it's been accelerating. And one of the reasons we think that happens is, is because of the way um, that their populations sort themselves as they spread. So um, you can imagine a population kind of moving. If we've got on this horizontal axis here, just, you know, just length, if we think about it in two dimensions, um, you can imagine a population spreading um, each year. And some individuals are going to go just a little distance and other, and then there's going to be some like medium distance that most individuals go and a few individuals are going to go really far under normal circumstances we might expect um, sort of range expansion to occur like this where um, these individuals um, then the next year they they spread further and then next year they spread further and it's it's all sort of un uniform uh, linear uh, progression of their their population but with the cane toads what we think is happening is that um stronger maters <laughs> or sorry, sorry, stronger hoppers rather. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. So stronger hoppers are just like getting to, to further distances because they're better able to hop that far. Um, and then the stronger hoppers are just mating with each other and producing stronger hopping offspring. So we get what we call in, in um, you know, evolution, like a, um, positively assorted mating uh, among phenotypes that just like to, to hop a lot. And um, and this leads to um, this ex like those individuals um, again being really good hoppers mating here, having offspring that are really good hoppers, and then those offspring having more offsprings that are really good hoppers, and um, this kind of um, what we call spatial sorting of the population, and and this has been borne out um, in the literature. Uh, so if we look at time since colonization on the horizontal axis here and a relative leg length in the 
uh, vertical axis here, uh, we see that um, those individuals that are on the front line that have just gotten to an area, they've got longer legs than those individuals who have been in an area for a long time, suggesting that, again, we've got those stronger hoppers on the front line. And it turns out that those stronger hoppers also um, suffer from arthritis because they're hopping so much. <laughs> and uh, and what else? Oh yeah, they just they just like like jumping machines. They jump in like uh, straighter, longer lines. They take fewer turns. They just evolved to be strong hoppers. So it's this funny consequence of just the spread of populations as they invade areas. And so when I saw the kudzu bug uh, for the first time, it landed on my shirt in like uh, 2012 or something as I was. Uh, like planting a, a, a cucumber plant, I land on my shirt. I'm like, what is this? This is beautiful. And when I saw this um, this radial spread of their population, I thought, hey, this is an opportunity to see if this happens in insects. Um, so what I did is I I drove across the southeast United States. Um, I went. Uh, I made kind of these two transects, starting um, in the Atlanta area. Uh, where they were first introduced, and then driving south along one transect, and um, then west along another transect, just collecting eggs as I went. And I brought those eggs back to a greenhouse, and I I grew them, <laughs> each egg, each clutch of eggs individually, on different plants. Uh, and then I put uh, the kudzu bugs uh, on a flight mill. Uh, I let them grow to adults, right? I let them grow to adulthood, and I put them on flight mills. Um, these are devices that just tether the insect <laughs> um, uh, to a spinning, uh, I don't know, I don't even call it, just, it's a mill, but it's, you know, it's got a rotating uh, shaft on top there um, so that um, it's powered only by the insect's flight. This is not a kudzu bug, but it's powered only by the insect's flight. And so every time it, it makes one uh, revolution, um, there's a little sensor here that records that, right? So you can tell um, how far they fly um, if 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 given the chance to fly forever. <laughs> and it turns out the kudzu bugs are really cooperative. Like as soon as they don't feel pressure on their feet, they kind of just start flapping their wings and flying. So um, they're a very um, cooperative insect to work with. So I had a bunch of these flight mills in a greenhouse and I would use a little like um, dollop of uh, magnetic paint, uh, sorry, metallic paint on their backs. And then I would connect them to the flight mills by a magnet. And, uh, and yeah, just let them fly around and see if we saw any differences um, in their the flight distance um, based on where I collected them uh, along those two transects. So um, along the horizontal axis here, I've got distance from the site of introduction. Uh, so the zero here is just in Atlanta and further away is either further um, uh, west or, or further south. And then on the vertical axis, I've got the distance flown in an hour. So I just put them up on there for an hour and see how long they flew for or how far they flew for. Um, and uh, so <laughs> for the first part of um, this study, it seemed to follow that, that same trend as the um, the cane toads, right? So as, the, as they got further away from the, uh, the center of their introduction, um, their flight distance increased. But as I got towards the margins of their range, it went back down. It went back down. So it wasn't quite what I expected, um, but there's some good explanations for this actually. Um, so it turns out that the kudzu bugs have had pretty much, by the time I collected them, by the time I collected them um, in uh, 2018, they'd pretty much um, hit their the the entirety of their suitable habitat. So here's here's kudzu. Um, that's the that's the plant that they feed on. Um, here's here's the kudzu's range. Um, they also feed on soybeans, so they're an economic concern. Sorry, I should have said that as well. Um, but here's this, the uh, kudzu range, and it, it pretty much mimics um, where we find uh, most of the soy growing in the in the southeast. Um, and kudzu bugs have kind of already met um, the edge of that, that range. And so what we think might have been happening is that um, they it's no longer advantageous. If you're going, uh, you know, from... Uh, Atlanta West, it's no longer advantageous to be such a strong flyer once you get to the margins of your suitable range, um, because you might just end up flying away from that uh, and not being able to find your way back. It's kind of like um, those flightless cormorants in the Galapagos. Like they've um, evolved to no longer fly, maybe in part because there aren't as many predators there, um, but also because uh, it's going to be difficult for them to, because um, they're out in the middle of the Pacific, and they may not find land if they if they make it. So those that flew less were able to um, put their resources into other body structures, obviously, and um, it'd be a little bit advantageous. So uh, that's my desperate attempt to add birds back in here. 
but uh but so you can think of those uh, kudzu bugs um on those front lines uh being more uh like those uh flightless cormorants I hope I'm getting that right. I don't know that much about the biology of flightless cormorants. Somebody will correct me later, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so thinking about um, invasive insects, now that I'm uh, in Cleveland, uh, I'm really interested in, in our latest newcomer, um, the spotted lanternfly, which has now been uh, in Cleveland for a few years. I've been collecting it uh, the past three years in one location. I'm interested to see um, how it's uh, both its coloration and its its wing morphology changes. Um, through the years, through the years. So, um, so yeah, invasive insects, not, not something I encourage, obviously, but they, they do provide us with um, interesting insights into evolutionary processes. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna move right along here. So going from uh, the bad uh, to the declining, it's no secret uh, that insects have been declining. Um, I, I remember growing up and seeing a scene like this uh, on my windshield during our uh, summer travels with my family, um, just insects splattered across uh, the windshield. Um, and uh, now it's less common to see that. And I know that, um, you know, what's the, how does the saying go? Like anecdotes don't make data, um, but it turns out uh, that there are data behind this. There was a, a, a Danish researcher who looked at the number of insects um, on his windshield <laughs> over 20 years. Uh, and and was able to to quantify it um, quite rigorously. Um, this is actually a, a pretty um, a pretty cool study. But yeah, over twenty years, um, uh, these people uh, yeah just drove along um, uh, two different transects of road in in Denmark, um, and and quantified the number of insects. And on the vertical axis here, I just got relative number of insects. So that's why the the values might be a little bit strange. Well, you can see a clear decline. Um, over the years, um, after accounting for things like temperature, time of day, wind speed, after accounting for things in those models, um, they they found about an eighty percent decline in um, insect biomass um, over the twenty just twenty years of that study. So pretty striking. And and there are other studies that show similar trends. So it's not just in in Denmark, right? Uh, here's a study um, that used data from the North American uh, Butterfly Association uh, that was collected uh, over over a few decades uh, in Ohio. And so here are all the sites um, where they had observations. And some of those sites, they had more than um, 11 years monitored and others they had less. Um, but they found uh, similar trends um, that uh, the predicted uh, butterflies uh, counted per minute um, declined uh, quite a bit um, in, the, in the 30 year time span um, of the study. I'm sorry, 20 year time span of the study. So about a, I think it's about a quarter reduction in the um, observed butterflies um, over the course of the study. So it's not good. It's not good. Um, and and some of the the major um, declines were seen in the Baltimore checker spot uh, and Aphrodite fritillary on um, two lovely butterflies. Um, other studies have shown uh, similar decreases in, in uh, different insect taxa, not just butterflies. So um, caddisflies, butterflies, beetles, hymenoptera, wasps and bees, mayflies. Um, these are the, the percentage of species um, from a, a review. So the percentage of species that have shown declines uh, uh, in, in this review study. So um, yeah, so 68% of caddisflies, these are aquatic, um, aquatic insects. Um, that uh, uh, yeah, sixty eight percent of those monitored have, have have shown decline in the past decade. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for these insect declines. Um, people call it like kind of death by a thousand cuts. Um, the biggest one uh, reported in the literature is intensive agriculture, so increased use of of pesticides uh, as well as fertilizer, um, which ends up in in streams and can uh, be detrimental to the aquatic insects. Um, other other uh, factors like pathogens and um, introduced species are, are another large chunk of this pie. Um, and then uh, urbanization um, is, is third on this list in, in, in the review studies. So um, uh, you might be surprised that uh, global warming thus far uh, is a little bit is a little bit uh, down on the list, um, but that's you know, probably going to change uh, as as climate change um, continues. 
Um, but uh, one of my interests has been in um, how urbanization influences our insect communities. How am I doing on time? Sorry, we good? Oh, about 10 more minutes. 10 more so. minutes. Oh, great, great, great. Yeah, this is going to work. This is going to work great. Okay. <laughs> so urbanization um, is, is, of course, um, an important factor um, leading to the kind of insects. It's just hard for insects to persist in, in urban habitats, right? There's not going to be uh, much vegetation uh, for them to enjoy. There's also um, urban heat islands, of course, are just like the um, the radiation uh, of solar energy from the the, the concrete impervious um, surface areas um, just raises the temperature um, in in urban areas, um, and it's just it's it's harder for insects to disperse and find habitat because um, there's it's fewer uh, and further between uh, typically in urban areas. Um, so I got interested in in this uh, as I came to Cleveland as I noticed clear um, gradients in um, kind of rural or urban areas um, that weren't like so you know I grew up in Los Angeles actually and so you don't see <laughs> clear gradients from urban to rural unless you're driving like hundreds of miles um, so it's it's really nice is yeah it kind of struck me um, as I moved up to Northeast Ohio um, and I was also really inspired by Dr. Lisa Rainsong. How many of you guys know Dr. Lisa Rainsong? She is so incredible. Um, she studies singing insects. I'm sorry that my uh, text seems to have gotten mucked up on here, but um, Dr. Lisa Rainsong, again, uh, recently retired uh, professor of, of music theory at uh, the Cleveland Institute of Music. Um, she's been studying the singing insects around here for quite a while. And uh, just poking around online, I came across her website, Listening to Insects. We have in Northeast Ohio, our own website dedicated to singing insects. So these are the um, crickets, katydids. Um, uh, cicadas aren't on there yet, but you might consider them singing insects. So we've got our own website dedicated to these insects. And I stumbled upon this. I was like, man, this is really cool. Um, I want to uh, to do some research on these guys. So it's listening to insects.com. I encourage you to, to check it out and listen to some, some local buggos. Um, you know, so for example, um, here's the uh, the common true Katie did. Um, I'm sure you guys hear this um, in the late fall all the time. Um, and I, I don't know if you can click it, but there's a little uh, there's a little sound icon up there, just so we can so we can recall what the the late fall sounds of the the common true Katie did are. Yeah, there you go. Oh no, maybe it's not going to go. Ah, bummer. It goes like, <laughs> wait, click, click it one more time. Oh. oh, yeah. What does that do? I was, I was gonna, I was gonna trick you. I was gonna wait till you clicked it, and then I was gonna go. Ch -ch 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 -ch. <laughs> but that's, that's how it goes. Oh no, PowerPoint is closing. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. No worries. No worries. So, um. So what's really cool about singing insects is that you don't require um, butterfly nets to go collect them or pitfall traps to collect them. Uh, you can actually just monitor their presence um, and to some extent their abundance by just walk or just um, standing outside listening for them, right? Um, so I was having some trouble getting permits to do other types of research in, in Cleveland. Uh, and I was like, well, this is perfect. I don't need any permits to just listen to insects. Um, so... Uh, what some students and I did is just um, tr this past summer in, in sort of a, a pilot study, I guess I would say, um, we drove from um, basically like Brexville Reservation up to downtown Cleveland along um, that uh, sort of rural to urban gradient, just stopping every kilometer or so and listening uh, for singing insects and, and just recording uh, what we saw or heard rather, sorry, what heard. Yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's right after Lisa Rain's song. Yeah, perfect. Oh, what? And it just went. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so here's a. Uh, a raster of uh, the Cleveland area and um, the green here, uh, I guess I should, I should start with the, the black. So black is a completely impervious surface area in this map, meaning um, surface area that is, you know, impenetrable to water, either roads or, um, uh, or buildings. 
Um, and then as it as it, it shades from uh, black to brown to green, it obviously gets less and less uh, impervious surface error. So we we drove this uh, transect here. Um, it's not a straight line. <laughs> it was uh, a straight line in our in our maps and in our minds. We were just going to go on this straight line, but um, obviously we uh, we had to stop where uh, we were legally allowed to stop the car and. <laughs> Uh, so it's a little bit zigzaggy and and here's like uh i480 i think we got stuck on that and we tried to pull off to the side but then we're like that's probably not safe so we got off the first exit and that's a little further away um but uh so we so we stopped every five minutes to listen for um candidates just like i guess um you know you would do for the breeding bird survey is that right it's pretty similar to that and, and these are the two wonderful undergraduates that i had uh, the pleasure of working with um this summer and you, we have to go out after night to do this. So it was like, we'd pack up the van and be out, out there listening to bugs from like nine to midnight. And I'm so grateful that they were willing to do that with me and that their parents were willing to let them do that with me. And like, we, we encountered some weird things, um, but it was fun and, and kind of an adventure. So we listened to, um, you know, all of the, the insects that we could. Some of them we had a harder time um, identifying. I am not as well versed as Dr. Rainsong is. I had a really hard time with uh, tree crickets, for instance, which is kind of sing at a single pitch. Um, but some of them were pretty easy to distinguish, including the common true katydid, did, Nebraska conehead, and the uh, rattler round wings. And um, so for each one of these, I'll show you um, the percent uh, impervious surface area on the uh, horizontal axis here. So that's going from um, no uh, impermeable surface is totally green uh, to 100%. And then on the vertical axis here will just be the probability of hearing it. So for common true katydids, um, there's like a clear cutoff um, seems to occur around uh, somewhere between uh, 30 and 40% um, impervi impervious surface area. Uh, sorry, maybe that's between 30 and 50. Um, but uh, there seems to be like this clear threshold um, by which um, they're no longer able to persist. And these that makes sense because although these are big insects, they actually don't fly very well. They um, they mostly just walk around. Um, they're not they're not strong dispersal dispersers. So uh, I think that it just gets really hard for them to find new habitat, even if it's present um, when there's more impervious surface area. Uh, Nebraska coneheads likewise um, declined um, as you got closer and closer to the city, um, as did the rattle around wing, though um, not significantly. Um, so as you're, yeah, so if you're living in a more urban habitat, you're just not hearing the same um, autumnal soundscape that you're hearing um, in more rural areas. Other singing insects weren't as, forgive, forgive the text here, but other singing insects uh, weren't as affected by um, uh, by urban gradients. Um, so Carolina ground cricket, striped ground cricket, Allers ground cricket, these are all really, really common insects that just like live in the cracks in the cement and just seem to not care where they are. Um, and although these lines show a, a, a subtle decrease towards urban areas, um, it wasn't significant at all. And, and in fact, the Allers ground cricket kind of seemed to increase um, as you got to, to urban areas. So so certain um, singing insects are more affected uh, clearly than others, and uh, it's not a surprise that uh, the katydids that you know perhaps require more vegetation um, and are larger anyway, perhaps um, they are more affected by urban areas than are uh, these ground crickets. If we look at total species richness, so on the vertical axis here, we just have the number of species we heard at each stop. If we look at total species richness, um, it also seemed to have like this threshold where um, it stayed relatively high. But then um, somewhere uh, above 50% uh, percent impervious surface area, um, it, it started to decline. And this this fits, this fits this, uh, kind of threshold model fits the data better than does like a normal just a line. Um, so, it, so, so there seems to be some uh, tolerance among these, uh, the, at least as far as the richness goes um, to urbanization. But at just some point, you know, you just, you're gonna lose species. I'm pleased to say that at all of our sites, we heard at least something except for one site. There was one site where we heard uh, no insects chirping or singing at all. Um, and this isn't a great photo, but this is uh, from Google Maps. Here's Harvard um, Avenue um, as it crosses the Cuyahoga River. Um, and right here, there's like tons of industry around here, right? This is uh, the training center for uh, Cleveland Cliffs. And um, I think Alcoa is across the street. Um, but at this area right here, and um, it's hard to see on this map, of course, but there's actually 
there's a little bit of vegetation. There's a little bit of vegetation there. There's there's a little bit of lawn. There's some trees. Yet yeah, we didn't hear anything. It was ghostly silent. It was wild. Um, so I'm interested in kind of looking into that again. Um, again, as a sort of a pilot study, we only stopped here once, uh, but it was the only place I didn't hear anything. Everywhere else, um, like these were warm uh, fall nights, and we just heard a lot of stuff, and it was it was surprising to just hear nothing at one site. Oh yeah, Washington Park is right there. You see that green space? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they there used to be a CMSD school there. I used to teach there, believe it or not. Yeah. And I think it's part of the Metro Parks, and then I think they also have a golf area. There's a golf course area there. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there's a golf course there. Oh, it could be. Are you is it suggesting uh, pesticides is from the golf course or? Yeah, I don't know. So I'm really, I'm really curious to kind of um, go return here and 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 try to suss out what's what's happening. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in for a second. Yeah. Um, uh, what about testing the soil? I mean, you sure. got you got That's alcoa plant, you got steel plant. Yeah, you yeah, got all kinds of stuff. And just like so. the particulate uh, matter coming Absolutely. out of the air yeah. as well. Um, we we sampled other sites. Uh, I don't have a good representation of it, but we sampled other sites that were close to industry. Um, you know, not not too far outside the uh, Cleveland Cliffs at all, um, and yet we still heard things. Um, even within the um, what is it called, the Steel Yard Commons? You know, with the Walmart, <laughs> we heard some good stuff there. We got cre tree crickets and ground crickets. I think we even had like a sword bearing a cone head, but um, but yeah, just not in that one spot. So I'm really I'm really curious about it. And yeah, my my suspicion is you know something pollution related, um, but um, but. To be determined, uh, uh, again, this is sort of preliminary. But uh, yeah, so anyway, so this research just um, suggests to me that, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it's not a surprise, I guess, that uh, insects would be declining towards urban areas. But um, I think we can do more um, to uh, allow for their persistence in urban areas. And I was, I was relatively surprised sometimes, um, like there was one parking lot where there was like this tuft of, of a grass in the median of a parking lot um, that they had obviously just recently planted. And we heard, um, you know, some, some cool um, large katydids in that one tuft of grass. And uh, so sometimes I feel like just, just doing it like just a little bit to improve habitat for these insects could go a long way and essentially go a long way towards um, helping out um, the birds. Uh, so I just have one last slide. I, I haven't really talked about ways we can in, improve uh the lot in life for our six-legged friends um but i'll just i'll just like share with you like uh, a few small steps that that uh, we can take as individuals um, a lot of this stuff seems to be so outside of our control um you know obviously uh there's a big movement to plant native and and that's a big deal um if you're a homeowner you're a, uh you know as doug ptolemy would say you're um you're perhaps an unwitting uh, wildlife manager there's a lot of uh wild creatures in your yard and not just at your bird feeders, but um, in your bushes and in your grass. Um, so planting natural habitat for your, your insect fellows to feed from uh, can be really beneficial. Reducing pesticide and herbicide use. Uh, limiting the use of exterior lighting to reduce, um, you know, attracting moths and other um, positively uh, and other insects that are attracted to lights uh, from, <laughs> from ending up near them in a little pile on the ground. That could be helpful. Uh, lessening soap runoff from washing your vehicles. Um, this could also be important. A lot of those soaps contain uh, phosphates or surfactants, which, which rub off the, the waxy cuticles of insects um, in the bodies of water um, that they end up in. Um, reducing the use of de-icing salts can also be important for reducing um, salinity to fresh bodies of water. Um, countering negative perceptions of insects. <laughs> Whenever somebody tells you how gross an insect is, just let them know, like, no, that's a cool bug. Those things are helping us out. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I run into a lot of, um, gosh, where were we? We were just uh, at a tutoring session on uh, on Saturday, and a roach was in there. And uh, I get it. Roaches are icky. I don't even like roaches. But um, the the overall response for people in the room was shocking. And I, I, I always have to remind myself, like, oh, yeah, other people aren't as comfortable or as interested in insects as I am. But I wish they were. And I'll, I'll get to you in just a second. Oh, there's a sixth one down here and just support science uh, and, and vote. Um, so those are, um, yeah, sort of six, uh, six steps for six legged insects. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's probably about time anyway. So I've talked about uh, good insects, some bad insects, but interesting. Uh, 
and some uh, unfortunately declining insects as you move from uh, uh, rural to urban areas. Um, anyway, thank you guys so much for having me. I hope I didn't speak too fast. Yeah, yeah you were talking about that and declining insects and all that. Reminds me, I, I was a biology major in college way back, a long time ago. And I had a professor in invertebrate zoology and entomology that he kept saying insects are going to take over the world because oh, cockroaches were around long before the dinosaurs. They've survived at least three mass extinctions. And we can have a nuclear war, destroy all of civilization, but cockroaches will still be around. Um, I like your thing about the katydids because I, uh, I've been living for the last 25 plus years in one of the metro parks and there's a nice and i can hear them all the time and i always tell people i said you come out here the one you don't hear them anymore you know summer's really over yeah yeah and that's a good um, point. another question too you mentioned about that kudzu bug um i used to live in south carolina back in the 80s there's kudzu everywhere yes yeah, now, yeah i go down to i in fact i'll be heading down to south carolina next weekend yeah yeah and you don't see that anymore along the roadsides or anywhere in the, in the, you know, at least I don't see it like the extent I did 40 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And I, I didn't even have time to mention it, but uh, kudzu bugs get their names. They feed on kudzu. So a super invasive vine in the South. If you're not familiar with it, they call it the vine that swallowed the South. And I thought I had an image in here before of like kudzu vines swallowing up a, a school bus. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Anyway, uh, so yeah, you used to see it um, much more commonly, I, I think, in the south. And I don't think you're wrong about that. Um, it's still yeah. it's still down there, but um, they have been doing better at eradicating it. It actually doesn't spread as quickly as they once thought. A lot of it was um, intentionally planted after the dust bowl and stuff to help stabilize the soil. So just if people stop planting it and are careful about not distributing it, then... Yeah, yeah, because I remember just flying back to Ohio from South Carolina uh, 40 years ago. Even from an airplane, you could yeah. see the kudzu, especially in the wintertime. Wow, yeah. That's yeah, you wild. can see it, and it's just, you know, I mean, and no doubt you could probably see it from space. Yeah, <laughs> I, I bet you're right. I bet you're not wrong about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's what I, I wish I could have seen it from space when I was driving around looking for it. Because I would, when I was driving around, I had to find those patches on my own, you know. And it was always like, is that kudzu? Like pull the side of the road. Yeah. And it would be ivy or something. I'd be like, this... yeah. When the uh, midges and the mayflies are coming out. Oh yeah, I can't wait for that. Are there any Sorry. questions uh, on? Okay. Um, so uh, Cindy asks, why are we not banning pesticides? I don't know if you want to comment on that. Oh, man. Yeah, I don't know if I have the expertise. I always come at this from like an ecologist perspective and not, um, you know, a, a grower's perspective. Um, obviously, pesticides serve a purpose. Like we want to eat food and we, we don't want to have to compete with insects for it. And they're really effective and that's and they're cheap and they're cheap. And so. Uh, that's the reason why why growers keep relying on them, and some of them um, can be relatively and like you know environmentally friendly, and others uh, aren't. Um, I wish, yeah, I wish we didn't have to rely on them. Yeah, certainly there are some insecticides that are banned, but um, it, it may come to pass that neonic neonicotinoids um, uh, maybe further scrutinized in the U.S. at some point, as they have been in Europe. Um, but I, I can't imagine uh, banning all insecticides uh, anytime uh, in this political climate in the in the near future. Yeah, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, do you use iNaturalist to support your research? Uh, great question. I love iNaturalist. Um, I I did uh, you know I guess when looking for um, kudzu patches actually <laughs> to circle back to that. Yeah, I would use iNaturalist to find uh, locations. And um, this last summer. Uh, I was looking for new populations of the West Virginia white butterfly, which feeds on a particular host plant, the two leaf um, uh, toothwort. And so I was looking uh, on iNaturalist to find um, those kinds of populations. Why do you have an interest in uh, iNaturalist? It's a good source for, yeah. you know, this cloud source. And, you know, from my backyard, you see something, you pop it in, and it spins up. And you're looking for a particular insect, and you can search by it. You can see where it all being. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely use it in like a supporting manner. I've never used iNaturalist data uh, in a study, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic resource. I'm so grateful for it.
Uh, you consider the kudzu bug to be a bad bug? <laughs> yeah, I, I do because it also feeds on soybeans. Um, oh, okay. And so, yeah, it's a, of ec economic concern. I mean, I personally, it's so endearing to me that I don't call it a bad bug, but I, for the sake of this study, I thought it could sneak it in there. Yeah. Are there birds that like kudzu bugs or? Oh, that's a great question. They are a stink bug. And so they release the smell, um, uh, this chemical that smells a little bit like sour apple. Um, and I kind of like it. I got used to it. Meredith doesn't feel the same way about stink bug smell. <laughs> um, so they're not uh, necessarily the most preferred um, insect, uh, oh, sorry, bird uh, food, but I'd be surprised if something didn't eat it. I, I bet there are birds that do, but I, I can I can say it over here. Well, yeah, that's, it is an introduced insect. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, um, it could be that birds haven't learned to recognize it or haven't evolved to um, compensate for the 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 noxious chemicals it contains, but but still a lot of invasive insects still do get consumed by birds. So I know, for instance, um, you know you you can see our native birds eating the spotted lantern flies, for instance. Um, they haven't like learned to uh, you know consume them in in great number. Um, but uh, but I'd be surprised if we didn't have some native birds that didn't nom on a on a cudsey buck once in a while. Yeah, good question. Anybody else have a question? Oh, perfect. I just want to mention that I was hoping you'd bring up that windshield uh, insect survey because I noticed that right away at one point. I'm like, I don't have to wash my windshield. As yeah. much. I don't know if that's good or bad. No, yeah, it's, you it's used bad. to have to stop like yeah. midway on a trip and, and stop at the gas station just to like to get those bugs off. And uh, Nancy, it's Jane. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. You know, <clears throat> Harshaw Chemical was um, an innovator for the uh, Manhattan Project. And there for a while, um, there was, uh, you know, fairly close monitoring. And the last I had looked, it was, you know, not a threat. But when you consider species as tiny and possibly reactive to foreign uh, substances or molecules, I do wonder whether or not some residual radiation may be affecting your study. Oh, uh, oh, the, the chemical plant that, um, sorry, what was the name of the chemical plant again down there? Herschel. Yeah, 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 that's not too far away. No, that's just across the bridge there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it could be. I, I honestly, uh, I have, I, right now that's as good a hypothesis as any. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, thank you for that. I, I, I just, um, you know, there's also radiation in the, um, salt that we put on our freeways and, uh, you know, drawing the connection to that, you know, Harvard area, I couldn't help but think whether or not in the, um, and especially like in the Baldwin-Wallace and, you know, Middleburg Heights area, whether or not near those freeways, there's been a depletion of insects. Of course, it could be because of the noise factor with all the, um, you know, air traffic and that type of thing. But I do wonder if, the salting is influencing our insect populations, again, with the radiation being part of that concern. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm not I'm less familiar with the radiation of, of, of road salt. I, I'd have to read into that. Um, I, I do know that road salting can influence insect communities on the sides of roads. Um, uh, in, in part because of their influence on the plants that some insects will, will then feed on. Um, but uh, in, in our experience, um, I think that if road salting was um, perhaps at play on the, on the Harvard uh, Boulevard site, um, it, it seems a little unlikely because all of our other streets would have been salted as well. And we were, you know, off of some very, very busy roads that would have been salted and, and still heard um, a number of insects singing. So. Um, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought. I have to look into it more, but uh, I don't, I don't think it could be chalked up just to the road salting alone. 
Yeah. And I guess one okay. other, <laughs> this, this is the Nancy, I, I promise. Um, you know, I've been really concerned. I'm sure Nancy and the other uh, members of the club have been concerned about the changing face of the Rocky River Reservation. And we've lost so many massive trees and moderately sized trees. And we recently drove through it this weekend and I was just amazed at the tiny, and they they look anorexic and one wonders whether or not they're even gonna survive. And I live um, just about five, 10 minutes from the Metro Park. And there's a was a, a significant, it was probably half acre size land and I'm watching the same impacts on that piece of property as what's happening in the Metro parks. And I would love to have you do some research regarding um, the insect invasions and use even use that as a lobby effort for um, moderating climate change because it's all that circularity. If we don't have the birds to kill insects, you know, we, I mean, we had the West Nile virus here just a few years ago that was um, kind of awesome. And I had a friend's husband who lived in North Ridgeville who uh, developed that. It's a killer. I mean, North Ridgeville, we had crows in the Metro Park. And I mean, there's, there's just this aspect of tree preservation and conservation and preserving the canopy for our birds it, it actually is a health a helpful health aspect and i'm talking public health not to mention the absorption of the pollution from the air but i i just think your research could be uh key in looking at how Insects are probably going to be invading our area um, at greater numbers. All right. thank, thank you for that. Th your comments. Appreciate it. How uh, about one more question from our, yeah. our audience here? Thank you. Um, your last slide where you're trying to get people to maybe think about what they can do. Is yeah, anybody yeah. doing any research about like how to say if this is what you did in your backyard, it would actually extrapolate out from that like if if how much of an impact like you're yes this is your little backyard but if like a thousand people did this what kind of an impact would be are there people yeah. doing that kind of research that's a great question i mean I, the 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 person in like the the popular culture who i'm most familiar with is, is doug ptolemy um who's written a few popular books about this like um is it bring nature home i'm, I'm sure people in here uh, some people might be familiar with it but um i think that uh he has has been doing some research and calculated like the surface area uh, of the United States that is dedicated to lawn, um, and if you were to aggregate that all that surface area into one place, um, it'd be quite a bit larger than Ohio, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and so it's considerable. It's considerable. It's uh, it would be you know like the the largest um, uh, national park, for instance, if if everybody just uh, converted their lawns to to native habitat. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, does that get to your question? And and there, and there are a lot of studies like um, yeah about um, there's getting to be more in depth studies. The first kind of round of of studies that address this are just like the the plant diversity in your yard and how that influences um, both the insects and birds. And so it turns out that the higher proportion of your yard that's native, uh, the more insects you'll have, and therefore uh, the more birds. Um, uh, what was it? Was it black cat ch chickadees? I'm forgetting now what bird they were studying in particular. Um, but uh, yeah, so they've shown like direct correlations between uh, what you plant in your yard and how well the birds do that that uh, nest in your yard. Uh, and now they're getting, uh, you know, studies have, have been getting a little bit more nuanced, looking at you know how the different like canopy structures in your yard um, influence the the insect and, and bird communities as well. So there's some cool stuff out there. I. I <laughs> Um, I, I would recommend, uh, yeah, bringing nature home. I do tell me as a good starting place. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you everyone for this evening. Let's give, uh, Dr. Merwin a nice round of applause. Thank you again. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. 
if you'd like to talk one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Merwin, you may do that. You'll hang around for just a little bit. Yeah. And uh, then, um, you know, please check out the things to sign up at the back table. Please, 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 if you have questions, see moi. Thank you, everyone. Have a safe trip home. All right. Thank you so much, Nancy.